What? Oh, I got to mute this. And here we go, 4 p.m. on the dot. Welcome, everyone, to the first ever Anyone's Game uh, Twitch stream uh, for our first week of our uh, second year of Anyone's Game. And for reasons all of you know, we are doing it online instead of in person. Uh, Anyone's Game is a tabletop game conference that explores creativity, design, and openness in gaming. And it's hosted by the Ringling College of Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida, and specifically our creative writing program with generous support from the Eiserman Family Foundation. So my name is Rick Dakin and I, am, uh, I teach in that creative writing program. I teach writing for games um, in all kinds of different ways, uh, writing comics, and I also am a uh, game designer and writer myself. Uh, over the next four weeks, so every Saturday at this time, we'll be exploring the entire process of game design from ideation to publication to promotion. Uh, every Saturday at 4 p.m., we'll be joined by two tabletop game professionals who will guide us through the ins and outs of development. This week, we have our inaugural dynamic duo. Uh, on my right, uh, Sarah Doom is a writer, game designer, graphic artist, and illustrator. Sarah is the lead developer and writer for Bluebeard's Bride and Velvet Glove, among many other writing and design credits. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. And on my left is Kenneth Height, a game designer and writer with untold scores of projects to his name, including Trail of Cthulhu, the Dracula dossier, and the Fall of Delta Green. And he's also the co-host of the award-winning Ken and Robin Talk About Stuff podcast. Welcome, Ken. Uh, thanks for having me, Rick. Uh, sorry we can't be in Sarasota right now, uh, but next year. Next year, it's 75 degrees here right now. It's um, 62 here, I think. So, <laughs> not as big a bonus as I normally get from there anyone's game. It's a little later in the year. Mm. Um, so here is what we're going to do. We're going to do what some guy named Ken Height called a game slow jam. Um, so for those of you who have never done a game jam, a normal game jam takes place maybe like over a weekend. We, we have them at Ringling fairly often. Um, and everybody gets together and tries and makes a game in like 48 hours. Uh, and all those games share some common theme. Well, we're not gonna knock ourselves out. All of us are tired. We're gonna take our eight to time. We're gonna take a whole month to do this slow game jam. Um, and we're gonna go through the process over the course of our uh, four Saturday conferences. Um, so I'm gonna reveal the theme in a moment. Uh, Sarah and Ken do not know what the theme is. Um, and they're going to start the jam process. And, and the theme for this first week is ideation and design. So they're going to throw out all kinds of ideas and go through their process and hopefully uh, explain their process as they move along. Um, on the Twitch stream, you can we have the chat going. And if you have any questions or uh, comments um, or any ideas that you want to throw in there, uh, we'll be monitoring that. And I will pass them on to our esteemed designers. Uh, so their work will be done here in a mere 40, no, 57 minutes, right? They will pass the baton and next week will be picked up uh, for further uh, design and uh, iteration by our next duo, which I'll uh, talk about at the end. So are you guys ready? Y'all ready for this theme? Yeah. So Couldn't be readier. Uh, the process was, I said to the class, hey, we need a theme. And so they started talking about what could, you know, what could be a good theme for this second in um, uh, anyone's game. And also it's Holy Saturday, Easter's tomorrow. Uh, and those things were in folks' minds when uh, together they did a little workshopping and came up with second chances. So our theme for it, the, uh, the game Slow Jam is second chances. So we're, we're hoping everyone out there will be uh, playing around with games that somehow involve second chances. Uh, and in traditional uh, game jam fashion, you're encouraged to like find the not obvious meaning, meaning of either of those words, right? Seconds can be all kinds of things. Chances can be all kinds of things. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you guys. You guys here, uh, 
phrase second chances, what does that immediately bring to mind to you when it comes to games, Sarah? Um, I'm, I'm writing, so sorry. Yeah, please. So the first thing it reminded me of is uh, this adventure where you play through the first time like a normal dungeon. Um, and then the idea is the second time you come back and you play it as modern day adventurers who find the notes of the first group and you play through it again. But this time you have like advanced warning of where stuff is, is trapped and everything. And I've run this, this adventure a couple of times and it's amazing because players, when they feel safe, when they know they're gonna get another chance, they do amazing things. They, they, will, they will know like what I'm doing is, is putting my character in danger, but I, I'm gonna try it anyway. Um, and also watching the cohesion of a group whenever people start falling out as they start dying the first time and people not wanting to keep playing without their friends. So it does remind me, and I know it's a very direct uh, thing, but you said first thing I thought of. Yeah. But it just reminds me of how much gaming is about the people at the table and doing it together and the teamwork aspect of it. Um, as well as how hard everyone can laugh when someone dies in a really stupid way. All right. Me, me included. So, <laughs> <laughs> Ken, what are your initial thoughts? Uh, my initial thoughts are that a uh, game about second chances is a game in which you play someone who died, uh, had a, a bad life, uh, and is back from the dead through whatever mechanism, uh, possibly as a ghost, possibly just resurrected corporeally, um, possibly sent back in time, poss uh, any number of, of, of options. I, I was sort of flashing on the corporeal resurrection again, possibly because of the, the weekend. Um, but the notion that you must then address not just the events, you know, get revenge on the guy that killed you, you know, make sure you're you know, your, your, uh, your, your little boy is taken care of, uh, you know, whatever else that you neglected to do in life, but also go inward and fix the things that were wrong with you so that when you die this next time, you don't have to come back and once more screw around in this veil of tears that you can move on to whatever next actual stage you're supposed to move on to. And it's a, it's a, almost a cliche, it probably is a cliche by now. And so, the reason to design a game with a cliche concept as opposed to Sarah's very clever generational model dungeon is that once you, it's much faster to get everyone to buy into a cliche. They understand it. They, they, they lock in. It's like, okay, I get it. I've seen movies and TV that, that do this. I've read books. I can, I can get with the program of needing to redeem myself and needing to fix uh, my screwed up uh, first life. And that means that you can then engage with either personal choices at the table or uh, clever mechanics that uh, uh, that the game introduces to alter your own personality and play forward from that, um, which I think would have to be a big part of this game to make it anything more interesting than just, oh, we're do good in zombies. Um, uh, I, I feel like you'd want to be able to have a shifting sense of, of of self and say, oh, this annoying thing that I do at the table is actually evidence of this character's bad habits. And so I can't do that. I can't fall back on that crutch. I have to go and do something else. And I think that would be the sort of fruitful area of exploration of the game is not so much, you know, um, uh, uh, getting revenge on, on your, your jerk of a husband, but figuring out uh, mechanically and then in play how to improve yourself and make yourself, um, uh, you know, worthy of, of going on, making yourself a, a better person. And I think that would be an interesting mechanical challenge. And uh, the sort of cliched notion of the story exists mostly so that that all stays out of the way of the mechanics. And so you don't have a bunch of uh, vampire clans to memorize or whatever. You have a, a very basic structure that lets you know all right, here's what we're focusing on. Here's the meat of, of the gameplay. That said, 
I love Sarah's notion of the generational dungeon. And I think it's a terrific idea. And um, generational play can also allow your care, your, your players to play an increasingly uh, either an increasingly good set of characters or characters who are not just faced with the, you know, uh, the 10 foot pit that killed uh, the, the guy whose diary they're reading, but also the fact that, oh, they, the reason it killed him is he was, you know, uh, a, a lone wolf and didn't work with his friends. And so maybe I can play better than that with my new character who is either his reincarnation or his successor in some other way. And I, I love the potential for generational role playing. I think it's super strong. It's something that almost nobody does anything with. Pendragon, of course, accepted. Um, but uh, the, the, I, have, I have long wanted to do a modern day mashup of a classic dungeon, something where you know, you're going back to the Temple of Elemental Evil and you're in World War I and you were digging out a trench and you bang, you right into it. And so it's a different story, but it's the same physical space that you know, something like that. And uh, again, you can't you know, be using other people's iconic property, that's a no-no. But obviously, if Sarah's in charge of it, designing a, a dungeon that is uh, as powerful and fun and, ch and chewy as, uh, as one of those classic dungeons, uh, you know, it's, it's falling off a log easy for her. Uh, so I, I love that generational gameplay notion. And I, the, the, literally the only pushback I would have on that is that I would want that game to also concentrate like like Sarah says, on the there's the camaraderie at the table that's part of it, but also on the, you know, very uh, maybe elementary or maybe uh, flat, but again, that's where mechanics and and play bring it out. Notion that oh, we're making better choices this time, and I would almost say, you know, let's do three of them. Let's do a you know a a, a proper fantasy era dungeon. Then let's do it in the Victorian -y, Indiana Jonesy era with bull whips and. And, and whatnot. And then let's do modern archeologists who are trying to make sense of it and figure it out. And the other question I guess that you ask in that structure is, are there virtues that your medieval fantasy warrior cleric or your uh, Victorian uh, occultist lady had that you wish your modern day occultist, your, your modern day uh, uh, archeologists, or maybe the, the fun thing there is that they're not archaeologists, they're urban explorers, right? They're, they're kids who have no business being at the dungeon, but want to go into it to get, um, uh, you know, Instagram likes. And so they're, um, they're going in for a different kind of treasure and uh, that all three of them are, are chasing treasure, but the treasure changes each time is another um, uh, fun conceit that you can do. And I, I feel like uh, that structure that, that Sarah immediately jumped on is is one that is so exciting and unfamiliar that right there that would sell the game uh that that high concept is so strong whereas my high concept is pretty bog standard and the way you would have to sell it is by really working on the mechanics so i guess those are that's what i would think about those two things sarah is my is my come back from the dead and fix your life game just as tired and awful as it sounds in my vaccinated head or is there stuff there it's not if you do it right. I mean, so so you are pointing to stuff to media like The Crow, mm -hmm. um, as well as I believe some more modern day TV shows that I haven't mm -hmm. watched because they're not explicitly horror, but right. so Heaven can wait. <laughs> right? You get that coveted Heaven Can Wait license. That's right, yes. <laughs> 1940s IPs are all just sitting there waiting to be snaffled up. They're like, hey, no. Um so yeah, so the, and what you said, the idea of, of a cliche, the revenge story where someone comes back from the dead to right wrongs, it's a cliche for a reason. And also the idea that it, the story then gets out of the way to allow you to, to play more with the mechanics. Um, I want to say that is actually a very strong argument as well for why using fairy tales and folklore in games works so well. Mm-hmm. Um, or Earth. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. And also, since we're supposed to be sharing how our process works, I am going to attempt to show mm. you my scribbles. Yeah, let me. Uh... 
I'm going to spotlight you so you can. Oh no, terrifying. Um, so you should screenshot that, Rick. Use your powers. Can you do that? Yeah, I can. So, you know, whenever you remember that I was trained as a visual artist, one of the things they taught me in art school was to just have fun with your notes because it lets you think. So what you have here is the beginning of a page that would probably go several pages um, of me starting to not only take notes on what my collaborators are, collaborators are saying, but also starting to include stuff that I'm also thinking about, which is why you got a little note like Revenants and Zombies, oh my, because I love them so much. Um, the idea of three core high concepts is a really, really strong one as well, because I'm sure Ken has had this too. Sometimes you start making a game and you're part of the way through and you realize, oh, this is not the game I thought I was making. <laughs> or maybe I'm wrong and Ken has never had that because he knows what he's doing. Um, I have I have certainly made games where I thought I was making a somewhat different game. I don't think I've ever started designing a Star Trek game and come out and said, this is a Battlestar Galactica game. What have I done? <laughs> but um, but yeah, so, you definitely yeah. go into sort of um, uh, different directions and different uh, uh, strange attractors. Some of that's in the course of just doing the research. You find something that's so cool that it has to be in the game. Uh, when I was doing um, Day After Ragnarok and I started with the notion of this is Conan the Barbarian, but in 1948, uh, and then started adding all the sort of James Bond and uh, Air Adventure comics elements to it, because Conan 1948 wasn't big enough for the for the world, and it sort of forced people into one kind of story. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted the world to basically the sort of one of the themes is that the world is so badly broken that now it's a sandbox and anyone can pick and play. And I wanted the the, the book to reflect that. Um, and of course, sometimes you're working with a collaborator and. You know, you have a vision and they have a vision and maybe they own the IP and you don't. And so you don't necessarily get to go the entire direction that you wanted to go. Uh, and that happens. And it's, you know, one of the fun things, though, is that you work with a collaborator and they do have uh, a different direction and a different um, uh, sort of goal for the game. And then you can think, well, games are more than one thing at the table. Can we make these goals overlap? Can we make them mesh right and that is you know that's the fun part of collaborating with another great designer is that you have that possibility and you know they solve problems that you didn't know were already there i mean any uh my my process if you're looking for a picture of it is literally this is sitting in sort of stream of consciousness and at, at some point i will hit on a uh a, a, a thing that already exists a pre-existing structure and that as Sarah, as you say, it might be a, a fairy tale or a, or a folk tale. It might be a historical event or place. It might just be the notion of urban exploration. And I'm like, I don't, I don't have enough books on that. I need to look into urban exploration and go on some urban exploration YouTube channels and see what sorts of things they get up to. And then if you discover that, oh, in fact, urban explorers are um, uh, always yelling at each other like people in a zombie movie or a, a, a paranormal reality show, then you say, well, there should be yelling in this stage of the game. We, there should be a yelling mechanic. People expect the yelling. And, and so th the, the notion, your, your very simple notion, which might be just visualization about how you and your game group would play it at the table, obviously always has to expand because if you're making a game that's just for you and your game group, the chances are very slim, unless you're Dave Arneson, that you will be able to sell that game uh, and, and make other people interested in it. So this, I have a question from the from the chat, uh, from uh, the very Eastery named Prof Prof 666. Um, Sarah, do you mean more along the lines of like a change in theming or realizing like a concept leads more to horror or something with implications and mood that was unintentional? And this would have been this applies, I think, also what you were talking about just now, Ken, but like 
maybe talk more about like I think taking uh, an existing structure as Ken referred to it and and you know making it your own. Yeah, I I guess to answer that question, uh, times where I've I've started a thing and it changed like a lot of designers, I have a folder full of dead ideas or they're not entirely dead. They're just like, they're hanging out over there. Some of them are cooking. Some of them are monstrosities that will never see the light of day. Some of them are potentially the next big thing I work on. Um, so, you know, so for example, I, I really wanted to hack Vincent Baker's um, it's sitting over here and I just, the king is dead. I really wanted to hack it. So I started with the idea of this is a mechanical thing I wanna do. And can and you, I, for those who don't know that, can you explain what about the king is dead that attracted you to wanna hack it? Well, there is this like, and as you can see, I'm rolling over to grab my little box. There is this incredibly cool mechanic, this, these sets of lists of these different actions you can take with another player that becomes this sort of give and take dance. And it, it, it may have been more prevalent in one of the first versions of the game, but I remember there was one because I was playing it and it's like, I chose I was going to hunt him. And then we, it was this like, the game experience was then like, are we seducing each other or am I trying to kill you? I am not sure. But I wanted to have that kind of like give and take interaction. So I took that mechanic and a folktale song about stags and hunters and maidens. And it's still working. But by the time I started working on it more, I'm like, I may not have made a hack. I may have made a new game. So sometimes you just start out and you think you're doing a thing and it turns out something else. Uh, otherwise, like, I mean, I, I love the fact that Ken keeps bringing up urban explorers because I wrote about that for cult and I could tell they were kind of like, all right, how are we going to get from these kids doing their YouTube channel to like angels? And we got there, you know, it's just like, sometimes you have to just go with it and give it a chance and see what your research gives you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I had urban exploring in the cult campaign I ran in the 1990s, now that I think about it. but um, yeah. It's a good match. It is a good match. Yeah. I, <laughs> um, I also wrote for cult in the 1990s. Um, so we like the urban explorers idea. Do you guys want to build on that? Is that something you think you both want to incorporate into this second chances game where we're working on here? Is that, or you want to toss around some more ideas? Well, I mean, I think that one of the things that we can think about is, is there a way to introduce notions of uh, changing or improving your character over time into Sarah's much hookier, better generational dungeon idea? Because the, the ability to um, uh, make the game also a metaphor for personal exploration and change in the tired Jungian alchemy sense. <clears throat> I mean, it's it's tired to alchemists, but it's not tired in role-playing because so little role-playing addresses your character's personality to begin with that um, I feel like, mechanically addresses, I, I feel like the possibility of making all of those games, uh, all three of those levels of the dungeon open up this sort of, I mean, you brought up cult this sort of uh almost gnostic degree of self-exploration and illumination could make first of all it could make linking the three levels easier because if there's an angel at the bottom of it or a you know some other sort of uh uh, uh revelatory monster then that will sort of provide you the explanation or the hook for why people keep coming back to this spot um, and I feel like, you know, I don't necessarily want to get too far away, but I feel like groups that are very much into dungeon and environment and outside exploration would have a lot to play with, with this generational dungeon. 
and I feel like players and play groups that are interested in internal exploration could be able to do that as well. And almost you would be able to put two separate games into one box. And so the challenge, you know, you it's very much like what mode do you want to play this game on? Do you want to play it on a personal uh, exploration or physical exploration mode? And obviously some of the activities would overlap. And you certainly, if you're, if, if the notion is that there is a fallen or awakened angel at the bottom of this dungeon, the, you know, the other obstacles and things that you face will have a similar effect. And possibly you could even, you know, have seven great challenges that are the seven deadly sins or something like that, uh, that alter their nature each time uh, you play through it, but have enough of the commonality that Sarah's notion of, oh, I know that this is a death trap. How do we respond to it becomes interesting and fun. And maybe that's part of it is, oh, I know that this is a death trap, but if one of us dies, the rest of us can get through. And so you have an opportunity for self-sacrifice or you have other opportunities for self-sacrifice. I give up the thing that I'm digging up an angel for. So you can even pull in little elements of stalker or annihilation, that sort of notion that there is, in addition to this weird exterior, there is an interior blankness that you have to map or else you've failed. Um, and I think that those two concepts, uh, first of all, obviously, Sarah's high concept is a million times better than my high concept. But I think that the mechanical notion of trying to present the necessity for you to change the way you play your own character as a victory condition or as a core play activity makes it interesting and vastly different from any other dungeon exploration sort of game. And I think that... Um, I mean, once you start, you know, building those as metaphors, you can go literally anywhere. You know, Jung, as I, as I mentioned, pretty much cornered the market on that in the 20s, but we can certainly lift uh, from him and uh, we can lift any number of other sorts of analogies, uh, you know, from the, the new age movement through um, uh, self-help, through genuine, you know, uh, Christian piety getting better through good actions and, and, and good uh, and, and good orientation to God. All of those can be in the mix. And again, that can, you can have a sort of a moral sandbox inside a dungeon or you inside know, three dungeons. You're correct. And my notes keep growing. And I, I kind of hate this because it's like, it's like my game design brain is turning on and I'm trying to tell it, this is just an exercise. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know what that means. Let's make a game. <laughs> yes, right. Much like my immune system right now. <laughs> yeah. So the notes are growing. And, and I think bringing up Annihilation is a great one because what those women go through as they go through the shimmer, you're really looking at them as broken people. Like they're all, you know, they talk about how they're all looking for this redemption by going into it. They all have their discrete goals and giving that to the players and having them choose what that is, that's part of the buy-in. But while you're talking, you also reminded me of as above, so below. So that's something I know I do a lot is, and I mean, you know, you can look at, at Ken's books, he doesn't mm. do. But whenever I'm doing research, I also look at other media that I can use. So if I were actually making this game, I would sit down tonight, rewatch Annihilation and As Above, So Below, um, and take lots and lots of notes and probably have some images, some imagery from that, some place I could look at to then be inspired by. So As Above, So Below, for anyone who doesn't know, is a movie about urban exploration where they believe they are going to find this uh, item of Christian value. And things gets really, really weird, really great, really, they're in the catacombs in Paris. And when the movie ends, you're not entirely sure if how it resolved. So some of the, the notes that I'm putting down here, having the two modes of the game the personal change versus the exploration, having the dungeon as a reflection of the characters, 
Um, and also having an opportunity, if a character dies, maybe we could do something really cool mechanically with what they do. Mm-hmm. You know, they could have some different choices. Maybe they come back as your revenant and maybe there's something wrong with them. Um, maybe they start assisting the GM instead of coming back as a player. You know, there are many different things that we could do that so that be- because in a game like this, you don't want players to be scared of dying and feeling like then they're out of the fun and they don't get to play anymore. Right, yes. The, the players who husband themselves are not going to be playing this game with the full degree of fun that they could be. And yeah, I think that the notion of what happens to you after you die that is addressed mechanically and uh, entertainingly in the individual scenarios of the dungeon make the game, it's another doorway into the philosophical, right? It's like, you know, maybe in the medieval one, in the in the trad fantasy one, uh, when you die, the thing that's left is just a, a white that's powered by, you know, your your sins and that's what's keeping you on the ground. But then in the 1980s, 1920s one, the Victorian Indiana Jones one, maybe when you die, you know, it's a different thing that's left behind and you have a different sort of a thing where there's a, you know, a, a God forbid, a table that you roll on or it's, you're, you're accumulating check marks as you go through the dungeon. And if you've gotten so much, uh, uh, you know, self-knowledge, then you can choose or you can, you know, have a, a different bunch of options. And then the final one, when you're the urban explorers, when you die, well, you better hope that you're somewhere near that angel when you die because <laughs> this one's for all the marbles, right? <laughs> You know, I really like this idea. It could also be if we if we separate out classes you can play, especially if it depends on which time period you're playing in, perhaps it is inherent in the class what you do after you die. Right. That can be one thing. And gonna gonna have some spoilers here for someone who's never played or read Bluebeard's Bride. Which you should um, all do. Yes. If you, Certainly if, anyone in advanced game design should have played yeah. or read Blue Bear's Bride. Um, one of the things that can happen is as you, you know, people all play different aspects of the bride's mind. Those aspects can shatter and then you're no longer a player. Um, and instead you are given specific instructions on how you can help the GM scare the rest of the people at the table. And we found, once again, to get the player buy-in, you know, you start the game out and you're like, these are my sisters, we're in this together, we're going to get Bluebeard, we're going to show him. By the end, they're all like, I'm going to fuck you all up so bad. You know, it's, it's, it's this thing. So one of the ways we did that was by making it a secret and it's supposed to be on the flip side of the character sheets or you can print it separately so they don't see it until it happens they know something's going to happen but they don't know what it is right and players love that i mean i love that (laughs) Mm -hmm. and again the 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 great thing about this is uh not to pile more work on gian and amari gian and amari is um you can do it one way on one level and then another way on the next level. And so it's like, oh, I know what it is. You flip your character sheet over and oh no, it's different. We, we, you were The GM was keeping track of your actions. Now you have to earn your way into this thing. It's like, what? And so by the time they're you know on the third level, you know they're in a state of quantum indeterminacy, which is a fun place to play in. And how, how invested would you be in that character if you went through these two different phases with them and you realize that, Oh, now, now it's for keeps. Mm-hmm. Now yep. what I'm doing is yeah. real. Mm-hmm. Ma- Meglin has a suggestion in chat. Uh, Meglin 16. I think I would like several weaknesses for characters that are inherited by new characters, but are converted to strengths if they are overcome during play. I think there's some interesting thing that like, yep. I, that that's, I think mm-hmm. all of this is a really fantastic idea. Um, it's but one thing we just haven't talked about is how they're, like how you track that continuity from yes. one to two to three. Heritability between characters is a great idea and a great part of the concept. And I think Sarah and I were both sort of assuming that it would happen in some wise. And I love the notion of sort of like a legacy edition of a board game 
where you well yes. look what you've done to trogdor you've cut off his anger <laughs> good job dummy <laughs> and so now when you're reincarnated you're you're not angry you you don't have wrath anymore in your personality and that's good on one level but on a love another level well maybe let someone else carry the dynamite <laughs> and you know that could also be something that's formalized in the game so instead of playing through the first time as random adventurers and you know like the module i mentioned uh the first time through the fantasy dungeon I don't know. You could either be regular explorers or we could we could invert it and have it be uh, the things that normally live in the dungeon that are the ones doing the activity. But then perhaps in the second, perhaps your characters all have something, uh, a talisman or a body part of one of the creatures that was from the first one that by the third one gets handed down, like formalizing that continuity in a way. Well, I think that if we're thinking of the first characters turning into whites, you know, yes. and staying in the dungeon, then you get you get to have your cake and eat it too. That's true. And uh, so it's like, oh, I get to face my old character and kill him. Could this be more on the nose? Um, <laughs> Very good point. Very good point. I'm writing that down. Uh, I, I, and I, I love the notion of inheritability and it can be, you know, through just something as, as mechanical as you've inherited, you know, the the diary or whatever it can be a reincarnation system you know where you've been reincarnated into these new characters it can be um you know you've studied this so much that you obsessively identify with the characters like in uh possession and yeah. you you know you you don't uh you don't have a notion of 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 where your free will necessarily starts and stops in in a situation like that and, and folks in chat are really reacting well to the um, the legacy idea. You know, they're for like like the idea of sticking stickers on character sheets and tearing up ability cards, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that still that has like still has, and I think could have that shock value, right? That certain mm -hmm. visceralness at the table of like, oh yeah, like you know. Um, and then Logan's asking, if anyone's played the game Overlord, of oh, the video game, I think, where the heroes are act are you know become the thing. Or worse than the villain, right? Sort of like a dungeon mm -hmm. keeper model too, right? Sort of what you were talking about in the beginning there. Um, Something. And and I'll just point out in in a in a in a game that is going to be passed on to Gion and then Shing, uh, maybe uh, making room for some physical artifacts in this design uh, would be something to think about. Yeah, I mean, at, at the very least, cards representing things that you found in the dungeon or took out of the dungeon. You know if if anyone survives all the way through the fantasy dungeon, then that increases the number of cards available to the Indiana Jones era uh, guys, because they find them in the museum and can bring them back to the dungeon to use. Uh, if it's left in the dungeon, well, then it's left in the dungeon. You Hopefully you can find that card when you explore it using the notes or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I love the notion of physical, you know, items, even if it's just cards, uh, obviously, I don't want to step on uh, Shing's uh, space and because I'm sure that she has a million better ideas than I do uh, yeah. or will. Um, but I, I love, I love the notion that uh, you, you have, you, you've accumulated or decumulated things, whether that be damage or changes, or you're also getting items or um, uh, personality traits or whatever it is. I think that's fun. I mean, my my sort of worst statement again, which is you know for Gian and Omari to ignore, is that if you're not representing it mechanically, then it's not really part of the game. And since cleverly they have to figure out how to represent it mechanically, <laughs> I think I can just say that. <laughs> so probably around this point in game design, I will typically take a moment, step back, and look at it and be like, are there any underlying themes? and do those support or subtract from what I'm trying to do. Um, so I think definitely we're working with ideas of identity, inheritance, that also leads to like genetics and uh, I'm not sure what word I wanna use, but basically like abnormalities. Um, you know, mutations, I think is. <laughs> mutations, yeah, let's go with that. You know, and that kind of goes back to, you know, 
looking at does that support second chances and it's like all of those things are it's like is this a game about talking about how you are not your predecessors or is it saying that you cannot completely erase their influence on what you're doing and I feel like by putting it in such three big different ideas it would successfully do that because especially once you get to the urban exploration and once you start having the weird reflectiveness of filming yourself and the other people you're with which is presumably mechanical mm -hmm. like once you start reflecting stuff in a game that is a little bit about inheritance and identity oh stuff's going to get really 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 messed up and really? then you can have the, the the challenges feed into those themes that you, I mean, like we were talking about the fallen angel and the, the whites that represent sins and other things like that. And some of it is going to, it should, I think, be on the nose, stuff like that. And some of it can be a couple of steps away that's more abstract, like the bear monster in Annihilation is more abstract than, than what it is. It's so my favorite. Yeah, the, um, yeah, at this point for me, the next step would be immediately start finding a actual location where there was a rumored buried angel. Yes. And if there was one, uh, finding out what kind of folk tales are told about it, what kind of real world, by real world, I mean, including people who are wrong in the real world, but what, what sort of real world spoor there is of something like this. And then saying, can we use these towards theme? Can we make these... Uh, part of our setting um, can we honor that actual lived experience of people in the past which again to my mind makes it both more accessible to players and more realistic even if it's a game about hunting a buried angel at the bottom of some European ruined building um, and so I, I I my notion is that you know where um, uh, where, where, where Sarah has her her, uh, her, her her sketches and her and her thoughts on that what i do is i go and i say given that there is nothing new when this phenomenon has existed before what was it like and can those things any of those things feel like what we want our game to feel like and so you just sort of rotate the iceberg and point the interesting part or the thematic part up and the rest of it just stays down below the ocean where they never see it and so that's my next stage in this would be to just um, go hog wild with um, uh, legend books and things like that. I mean, that is your strong point. Like, <laughs> so Prof, Prof, yeah. Prof has another interesting idea that um, I think we've hinted at, but so they write, it, it could be about a sense also of facing your idols problems. Maybe they were like family legends, right? So like that, you know, what is your relation? What is, you know, that should be a part of it, that probably like, what do you actually know about your predecessor and what is your, your and, and I think one of those game? notions is that when you are playing the game, you get to pick which set of, you know, which, which, which set of challenges are you going after? So maybe, yeah. you know, you play a character who idolizes one of the past characters, but that's a choice that you've made maybe uh, when you pick up the game or, if it's just a, a more constrained thing, there's always six players. These are the six roles. One of them is someone who idolizes. One of them is someone who hates and fears. One of them is someone. And so you have all the different possible approaches. I think you should represent them all potentially. Um, and then the question is to what extent are you pre-generating all the characters and to what extent are you selecting from a set of characters that then, oh, it turns out that they, you know, they worship somebody, which of the six predecessors is it? You pick it and then that changes you depending on that play. So I like that. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm reluctant to constrain character choice as much, yeah. but I understand that it can make uh, design of the game easier if you do it, because then you only have to come up with six stories instead of potentially 180. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say, it's like, it depends on the kind of story you're trying to tell, right? Mm -hmm. Is it a specific story about people going through this dungeon? Or do you want it to be more open-ended? And my my instincts at the table, 
and as a designer are always to move it out and make it more open-ended but obviously bluebeard's bride exists to say that is not the only way to do something uh, magnificently so i i was just i was just laughing inside because i'm like yeah mine is is the opposite i'm like mm -hmm. go as specific as possible yep primarily because the strength of specificity is the constraint and the creativity that comes from constraint mm -hmm. and being able to support the story you want to tell while still giving people fun time being creative. Mm -hmm. um, I think- oh. oh, go ahead. The, the next, the other part too would be how do you generate the dungeon for the GM? And I, because... Let me just throw in Magdalene's question before we, because that's super good, but oh, Magdalene yeah. just had one thing to add in. It feels like the primary theme, and this could be one of the themes, could be improving what came before and maybe breaking away from the expectations of your ancestors. I think that could be another one in that pool that you guys were talking about of you idolize them or you want to break away from them or right, you know, mm -hmm. picking, but no matter, you got to pick one, right? Yeah. Pick some relationship to it. You can't be indifferent to them. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you can't, maybe that's one of them too, I guess. Yes just just in it for the uh for, for the for the money like, I, I feel like having a connection to the past is an important part of the yeah. game though because that's what it's about yeah. it's about changing yeah. in response to that so um, sarah you were talking about how do we make this dungeon oh sorry because because you know th this is game design in action yeah. like now i have eight different things <laughs> on the page <laughs> yeah. um so with, with dungeon generation you kind of, you have to acknowledge the fact that <clears throat> you're relying on a cliche. You are doing something that's been done before. So then you have to decide if you want to do it uh, as expected, if you want to subvert the expectation, or if you want to do something completely different. Um, now there's, you know, there's been a rumor running around that Bluebeard's Bride really is kind of a dungeon crawl. And I certainly would not. Um, foster those rumors but you know there are many well, it's very brave ways. of you to address them sarah in, <laughs> at, in this environment at this juncture i think that's that's a that's a model for other designers i don't know you hear you a pernicious rumor like that you should just get right on top of it you shouldn't that's right let it bubble away in the background informing people who would ever think that playing bluebeard's bride in some ways feels like doing a dungeon crawl set in a house um and I, I i bring that up because there is a methodology for generating the rooms in the in the house uh and that is snuck into the character generation but it still is since bluebeard's bride is about subverting expectations society puts on women or at least highlighting them until it hurts you know, if you're doing a dungeon like this, even if they're really, whether or not there really is an angel buried in the bottom or whatever your shifting goal is, you know, it is usually much more fun to subvert the expectations if you can. Um, but the GM should be having fun too. It should be fun to make the dungeon. It should be fun to set up all this stuff for them. And if you can, you know, reinforce the themes through what the GM is doing, give them, you know, specific things they do, depending if it's personal mode versus exploration mode. Um, give them a way to keep track of who died where in the dungeon each time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, those are all good things to think about whenever you're designing it from the GM side at the table. And you can have a compromise solution in which we know that there are five places that will be, or seven places that will exist in the dungeon and then the places between those seven places are created procedurally at the table. And then maybe once you've created the medieval dungeon, you keep the map the same for the modern dungeon, except that you have a legacy effect because first of all, you've got all these whites in it. Second of all, they've cast spells or they've done whatever else. And so you've changed the dungeon and the dungeon has altered. And maybe their actions make the angel get up to some activity in the ensuing 500 years. And so, you know, parts of the dungeon shift. And so they're, they have the, the notes or the, or the map written by the original explorers, but it's mostly right. 
see, Ken, you would you would be so good at that. You could put in like all these real life historical events that show that the angel is like stirring, mm-hmm. and what that would change in the dungeon. It's like, can that actually close off this room? Can it shift things over? Can this white get released? And I and I would love the idea if the dungeon changes in response not just to the player's actions but to the player's beliefs about the dungeon. Yes. That. <laughs> that somehow they're imprinting on it that that and you don't tell them that but you as the gm that's part of the fun is you're like oh we've got someone who's still got religious faith well we're gonna do this that makes this dungeon shift that way or we've got someone who is skeptical and says there's no angel down there it's just a big old meteorite radioactive meteorite and mm-hmm. so it's like okay what is that character encounter and how do we change the dungeon because we've got that set of beliefs going down and uh i i feel like making the dungeon not just the legacy of did they bring dynamite in 1920 but the legacy of what did their uh i mean again the notion of uh, people's uh minds or souls as buildings is as old as aristotle and the notion that as you are changing your mind or soul you are also changing the building that you are exploring that symbolizes your mind or soul is i think a can lead to a lot of very great things that work even though no one at the table knows why they work yes they just they just rhyme they don't match um uh and and that can uh be very very fruitful play where both gm and players know that this is happening for a reason but they're not sure what the reason is that's a great moment at the table and it would be lovely to, to to encourage that kind of thing with the dungeon uh shifting but some of the the core fun of the game is yes there is this shaft and if you found it in uh 1350 it's still there in 2020 or whatever and and so you don't want to do too much monkeying around you want to do just enough to have the character that and some of that can of course be monsters or whatever that lurks in the dungeon and those can change and, and 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 morph and and alter uh, wildly in a way that the physical architecture of the dungeon maybe maybe that is is a dynamite or fireball takes to to alter that you know in a way or a, or you know a character dying and their yeah. when their soul is is riven and, and taken down to the bottom by the angel it leaves a trail or it leaves a, a, a scar or a crack or, or busts up one of the rooms or something and that can be an, another thing where yeah sure i died but i i wrecked this corridor for anybody else <laughs> <laughs> this dungeon will remember that i died here <laughs> well that should be like a goal on your character sheet. Yes. But... Like, well, the only way out of the room is if one of us dies and blows open the wall. Harvey? <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> but you also touched on something so important in that. The idea that the the shifting end goal that you get to as urban explorers, that it could be personal and different for each person. Yeah, that's the sort of stalker element of it which again is is super uh fun and is uh it's used in a number of games but again it's yeah even tarkovsky didn't use it enough so i feel like so, someone in chat is referencing the one page rpg this is not a place of honor i don't know if either of you know that not a place of honor no but let me the know. characters in the past and the present uh a pc plays as could be foils to to each other mm-hmm. so um i don't know it so i've uh, seen it but i Meglin don't has remember a... anything about it Meglin has a question. This is good. We need to start wrapping things up. And this is a process question. Uh, At what point do you decide between continuing with an idea or filing it in an idea box? I mean, to be blunt, am I being paid for that idea yet (laughs) is when I decide. Um, If I've got an idea that is so good that I feel like I can sell it, I may at least work it to a proposal stage and ask whichever publisher I think might be interested, does does this look like something you'd pay for? And if they say yes, then then we keep going. And if they say no, then it's in the idea box. Um, and if it's just something that I'm doing on my own hook, maybe I'll do it, if it feels really strong, maybe I'll, I'll put my player, my, my home play group through it. Um, although if there's a lot of design and writing that need to get done, maybe I won't because that's uh that's a big investment and it and a lot of it depends how much of it can i can i fake out of my head versus have to work out structurally to rhyme and, and balance uh most play groups 
in, in my experience are pretty tolerant of, you know, you <clears throat> uh, improving your way through a, an idea or a story, um, but very few uh, paying audiences should be tolerant of that. So what about you, Sarah? Well, it's a little different for me. Um, so since the company I work for, Magpie Games, uh, publishes pretty much exclusively Powered by the Apocalypse World games, that's the first thing I have to decide. Um, although, you know, we have branched out and we have slightly different things, like we have card games now. Um, so for me, as I'm, I'm going through it, at some point I have to stop and go, is this Powered by the Apocalypse World? And if it is, I will keep working on it. I will show it to my coworkers and they'll be like, that's nice, Sarah, but that's not sellable. <coughs> and then I will go back and I will see if I can make it more. Um, and if it's not powered by the apocalypse world, uh, like the hack I mentioned that I was working on, it's not. Uh, I, I keep it to the side and it may be something that I would put out on my own. But I have that capability. Not everybody does uh, mm -hmm. because I can do layout. Um, even though that's not, a, that's a whole big conversation right there. Right, yeah. I feel like I could put out something that I am proud of because I know layout. And I would probably engage an editor. Um, but otherwise, I don't normally approach other companies with game ideas. So Ken is the one has the expertise on that yeah I mean, and certainly if uh self-publishing if i think i could kickstart it successfully that sort of would go in that same box but some of the ideas the, again because i began in the ancient times when you began by thinking of does this match somebody else's game uh portfolio uh that's a lot of my creative juices run and some of it is challenge you know ken how do you do a call of cthulhu scenario that is original how do you present something that has not already been done for the greatest game in the world with the greatest scenario line in the world? How do you make something that can stand up on its hind legs like that? And and that's a design challenge. And I have met it and offered it to Chaosium. And I think it's in their game closet right now that when they have <laughs> a, a big pile of, of, of squander on Ken money, they will, they will come back. Um, and in the meantime, I'm working on other stuff. Uh, and, and some of it is, can you kickstart it or is it a small enough scope in the sense that it takes you a, a, a constrained enough amount of time to produce that you can expect to get uh, recompensed by self-publishing either on itch or on drive through or however else. And that's, you know, that's a question that you have to ask about your own sense of, of time value that, you know, I can't do that number for you because I don't know what your mortgage is or your rent. Right. right? So and because, okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, we're I, coming I just, up on time. If you want to go wrong, we can go along a little bit, but I wanted to make sure we took some time to sort of recap our idea so that I, we can, we can pass it on to Gion and Omari. Definitely. No, I was just going to do, to, to agree with that and say, definitely running a Kickstarter is a different set of skills than designing a game. Yes. Vastly different. <laughs> Self-awareness is good. But yeah, let's uh, let's elevator pitch this game. <laughs> Rick, do you want to? No, it's not. This is your this is your, this right. You guys are getting paid to be here. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, basically, I think that we've settled on the notion of it being the generational dungeon that Sarah mm -hmm. came up with. That it's in three different time periods: uh, medieval trad fantasy. Uh, Victorian slash Indiana Jones era adventure and modern day urban exploring that the goal of the game is to model or play with self-exploration and change uh, your responses to the past uh, and how uh, you either rebel against or settle for uh, previous conditions that the uh, players absolutely, the player characters absolutely have a legacy component to them in that they change both within the individual times and that the previous scenarios inflect who you play in the later scenarios. Uh, there is some degree of continuity, whether um, uh, overt in the sense of reincarnation 
or covert in the sense of you're playing someone who's interested in that previous character for some other reason, uh, bloodline research, whatever it happens to be. Uh, the uh, dungeon environment also has a degree of legacy, but probably is more static because part of the fun is re-encountering sa the same dungeon environment in a different uh, uh, game frame. And uh, lastly, uh, maybe there's a buried angel at the bottom. <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah. Um, I would only add yeah. that to remember that the dungeon is a reflection of the players or right. player characters. Mm -hmm. Um, as well. Other than that, that sounded really good, and I totally want to make this game. Damn it. Uh, well, but the, the best part is we've, we've now turned it onto Gianna and Omari to make. It's like, this is the best true. part in the world is now people who are really good at making games are going to be in charge. <laughs> and then Banana and Jason are going to pound on it and get it into mm -hmm. shape. So, yep. Yeah. Shang, ask for Shang and uh, Ruel will uh, produce and market it. Yeah. Yep. Um, I guess my final question is and there could be no answer, but does anyone just off of the top of their head have a working title for this? Mm. I don't. In, 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 feel free. In, 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 my, in my head, it would be the name of the dungeon is the name of the game. Yeah. And um, uh, that would be the, I'm, previously, as I mentioned, research a place where there's a buried angel. I would either use a real place or I would, do isn't a there, calc of that name. Ken and Robin episode about a buried angels? Or no, it was an alien. Yeah. But, yeah. So um, uh, um, you, you might, you, uh, I mean, Engels Graua is a terrible name. It doesn't roll off the tongue at all, but it would be something like that. You know, um, look up Angel's Grave in a series of European languages. And when you find the best one, uh, saying maybe Angel's Grave is, maybe, maybe the uh, angel is in England somewhere. Yeah. And so Angel's Grave is not a terrible name. I might say that's actually it. pretty good. Let's I could we'll start with that's a working title. Subject mm -hmm. no one's holding anyone to it. Uh, does that sound good to you, Sarah? It does. I do know from experience uh, how frequently people will type a angle instead of angel, and it hurts me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we can maybe add in that Genghis Khan is somehow involved for the other <laughs> worst spelling mistake ever. And Gandhi. <laughs> and Nietzsche while we're at it. But, yeah, um, right. All right. Well, I'm excited about Angel's Grave and um, or Angel's Grave. Maybe there's a Hound of Tindalus down there. Who knows? You can say. Um, and I really want to thank you guys very much for joining us here this afternoon uh, for our inaugural uh, Anyone's Game Season 2 Game Slow Jam. Uh, I would encourage everyone to, you know, I guess do you like and subscribe on Twitch? You can definitely follow us here on Twitch and on social media, and we'll be here back next week. I also want to point out, because this is very exciting, if you go to the Anyone's Game Conference website, um, coming this Thursday at 1 p.m., one bookshelf, uh, the uh, who own Drive Through RPG, are devoting all month their regular Thursday afternoon podcast to sort of following up. So we're going to have some students from Ringling and whoever else wants to join in, you know, talking about their own ideas for our game on the theme of second chances. So uh, check that out. Again, that's Thursday at one and there's links to that on the Anyone's Game Conference website. And this will uh, eventually be on the YouTube, right? Yeah, well, I should, this will be up on YouTube in the next 48 hours. Fantastic. So all of these will be up on YouTube. And of course they'll be on, they'll live on Twitch for two weeks as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to thank you guys again. Any final words of uh, wisdom or terror on this Easter weekend for our uh, for our viewers at home? Um, well, thank you so much uh, for having me on. This was quite a bit of fun. Um, and just mainly, if you think you want to do game design, you should and beware for it is hard to uh, not do anymore. <laughs> All right. Like well. heroin, it's expensive and hard to quit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, obviously I would say uh, play Bluebeard's Bride, look at Velvet Glove, look at everything Sarah's done. You oh. probably couldn't ask for a better model of 21st century game design professionalism than Sarah. She's uh, amazing and it's not enough people love her as she should be loved. She doesn't come up in enough conversations. All right. Well, well we can you. 
definitely get behind that. I love Bluebeard's Bride. Um, so that's all we've got for today. I'm going to uh, end the stream now and uh, hopefully we will see you all back next week.